can lose Climb the fence, books and pens I can tell that we are gonna be friends Riba al-Assad, we've mentioned the name al-Assad already today, it's the same name, yeah? Riba al-Assad is, is, however, a different kind of character from the Assad, Bashar al-Assad we are more familiar with from the headlines uh, in recent weeks and months. Uh, he is one of the organizations he's responsible for and he's affiliated with is the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria. He's also the founder and chairman of the, uh, the Iman Foundation, which is those two organizations pretty much dovetail, I think it's fair in saying. The Imana organization is more responsible directly for religious matters. Okay, okay. Okay, Rebel, let's sit down and let's, uh, let's, let's talk, yeah? We're here to talk, about, um, to talk about freedom of expression, freedom of speech. We'll specifically be talking now, obviously, about Syria. But let's talk about you, first of all, to begin with. Yes. Yeah? Uh, some people will know who you are, other people won't. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about who you are. Yes, actually, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure to be at the ICD and amongst uh, so many distinguished guests. Um, I have, uh, I'm Bashar al-Assad's first cousin, and uh, I was exiled uh, from Syria at the age of nine years old um, with my family. Of course, my father was uh, vice president at the time, and uh, he had disagreements with uh, his brother, President Assad, which is Bashar, Bashar's father. Um, I lived uh, since nine years old in France. I moved from France to the U.S., to, to Spain, to the U.K. Uh, and I got to see, uh, you know, uh, the realities about how uh, the word, the real word is, uh, not the word that we were having. Even as a young uh, child, I had to uh, many difficulties. I remember in Syria, I didn't have a normal childhood uh, because, as you know, we had problems with the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria during the 70s and 80s. So, uh, uh, at one incident, we had uh, a truck who tried to uh, drive, uh, you know, uh, to, into our home, and uh, you know, uh, it got stopped before it was able to, uh, you know, to set up the explosion. And uh, uh, it was very difficult. We didn't, I mean, go, even going to school, as I remember going to school, uh, heavily guarded. We couldn't go to, uh, you know, to uh, friends' birthdays or be at any social uh, events. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a very nice experience, you know, uh, living abroad, seeing how democracy works, uh, how uh, people live abroad. Uh, and in, it encouraged me actually to uh, start working towards, uh, you know, uh, democracy. Start working to uh, for my country, for free media, free uh, freedom of expression, all of that. Uh, we we then started the the first Arab satellite news TV channel in the Middle East uh, to uh, to promote democracy and freedom. Uh, and its headquarters is in London. It was uh, its name is Arab News Network. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, in '97, I was studying in uh, in uh, Boston. Uh, I came back for uh, Christmas and New Year's holidays to visit my family, who my father had came back to Syria after his mother passed away. Uh, but he was again under kind of a house arrest in Latakia. Um, and while I was uh, there, my father got dismissed, and he was allowed to leave the country as they were uh, paving the way for uh, President Bashar to come to power. Um, so uh, my father left. I had to stay there, take care of our family's charity, uh, which were giving uh, food and salaries to nearly 10,000 families every month. And in '99, I, uh, I traveled again to see my family in Spain. And uh, one week after I, uh, you know, I, I arrived in Spain, our house got bombed. The army attacked our house in Latakia, uh, leaving a lot of casualties. Uh, 200 people were arrested at that time, put in jail. Uh, for four years uh, and unfortunately at the time the media again I blame a lot of things on the media on the Western media too who was <coughs> trying to help uh, Bashar al-Assad's ascendancy to power so they said uh, they took the regime side of, uh, of the facts they said that the regime had attacked an illegal port belonging to us which was complete and at the time there wasn't any YouTube so there wasn't any possibility to put uh, uh, you know pictures or videos of the house that got bombed and you know, uh, 
thanks to YouTube, now it's, you, could, uh, see, you could see the house. It's not, it wasn't a legal board, it was a house, and you see how it was bombed and, uh, in Latakia. Uh, <coughs> again, in, uh, in 2000, when uh, my uncle passed away and uh, Bashar, uh, they changed the constitution for Bashar al-Assad in 45 minutes, we were the only one who came out and said, this is a travesty, you should not do that, you know, this is unconstitutional and it's going to lead to a disaster. Not, not because we have anything against Bashar, it's just because Bashar was uh, a young man in 94, he was studying in London, it was his first year in London, and uh, at that time the whole Western media came out and said, Bashar is a British educated, he's, uh, you know, he's westernized and all of that, and he had not anyone who spends a year studying abroad means that he's, he becomes a Western educator. You need a lot more than that. But as you know, the, the media really uh, propped him up and tried to make of him like uh, the new uh, man who's going to uh, change Syria and move it forward. Uh, and we were criticized, of course, for <coughs> because of being the only voice who said it is not normal and this should not be accepted. Um, but again, as you all know, um, uh, Prime Minister Blair, uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, King of Saudi Arabia, they all went to Syria, uh, President Chirac, uh, who received him even before he became president, uh, and it was against all protocol. Uh, um, they all went there, even King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who was Crown Prince at the time, he came out and said, I left Syria in safe hands. So we were okay, then it's what the international community wants, then we have to, you know, uh, in a way shut up and, and see what's going to happen. And uh, <coughs> in 2003, as you know, the, uh, f first he tried, uh, you know, the, uh, the Damascus uh, <laughs> Spring in 2001, uh, allowing people freedom of expression, kind of, you know, trying, uh, talking about democracies in uh, salons in people's homes. Uh, but a few months after that, <coughs> he had to stop it. He had to start putting those people that they allowed to speak about democracy to put them in jail. People don't understand why. <coughs> that shows you the, I mean, the, the power that Bashar has, which a lot of people don't know. He has no power in Syria. He's really a puppet in a way. People around him, the security services, the, in the security apparatus, those people who had interest under his father are the same people who brought him to power. And they only brought him to power because he could keep, he's a weak person, and he could keep their interest in place. Um, so as soon as uh, he started allowing those uh, the people talking about uh, you know, democracy and change towards democracy, uh, the secret services came to him and told him, you know, the head of secret services, that what you're doing is very dangerous. Uh, people in those, uh, you know, when they're sitting and talking about democracy, they're, they're not criticizing you, but they're criticizing the previous regime. And the previous regime is your father. And you're the only legitimacy that you have. It's because you're the son of your father. And uh, <coughs> so this worried him a lot, and they said that uh, if this is going to be, you're going to have to pay the price for it. So they arrested all those people again. And in 2003, as you know, uh, after the, the Iraq war and the Americans invaded uh, Iraq, he, Bashar got very scared because he, uh, they knew that they're going to be next. You know, after the Saddam Hussein was toppled, it was signed that dictatorship is not anymore allowed in the uh, in the area, and that we're going to move towards democratic change. Um, so he started, he got very worried, so he started uh, helping all the Islamists in Syria. Uh, I'll give you an example. <coughs> in the 90s, for example, you only had uh, 10 to 15 percent of women who were wearing the veil or the burqa or charor. Uh, now you have 80 percent of women in Syria who wear the veil and the burqa. Uh, he helped all these Islamic forces. Uh, he started creating, they started creating all those uh, extremist groups that they would send to fight in uh, Iraq, uh, they would send to Lebanon, like Fatah al-Islam, for example, they sent to Nahr al-Barid, uh, to, to use as an excuse to reinvade Lebanon at the time, of course it didn't work, but the whole Nahr al-Barid got destroyed, over 35,000 people, uh, you know, had to, uh, to move to another uh, area, to another refugee camp. Um, and it was, for him, it was a, a message to the West. It's, it's either you deal with us, we're a secular regime, or you would have to deal with those Islamists. And, and for, unfortunately, this turned, this what we've seen today, this, uh, the same thing that he has created is turning against him and against his regime. And uh, in uh, 2009, <coughs> 
our TV channel started getting jammed by the Syrian regime. And uh, there was nothing, uh, anything to do about it. There are no laws, actually. Uh, I mean, we have 40 people that were going to lose their jobs in, in, in the United Kingdom. It's, it's a British company. We have contracts with other British companies and European countries. And there was nothing that the UK or any other countries could help us with. So for three months, we couldn't go back on air. Uh, we're going to, I mean, we, something that we had built since 1997 was going to close down. It was really horrible. Uh, so I started, uh, I said that we should not stop, the Syrian regime could not stop us, and we um, was going to start, uh, I set up the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria, uh, shed a light on really what is happening in the country, to uh, campaign for democracy and freedom, to go and meet uh, parliamentarians and uh, decision makers all over Europe and the UK. And it was very sad, it was very difficult, because at the, si at the time, I was going to British Parliament and other places, and everybody was saying, yeah, Syria, you know, not even in a thousand years, democracy, what are you talking about? You know, like, it was really, really difficult. Even some people who were parliamentarians but who were close, I mean, they, they used to go and come to Syria often, they weren't even that much interested uh, into meeting, I mean, meeting with us. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, this is what we all see what happened in Tunisia. People can't take it anymore. Uh, it started with uh, Boazizi, you know, who set himself on fire, and of course, this has uh, led to, uh, you know, the people rising up in Egypt, in Libya, uh, in Yemen, in Syria, in Bahrain, <coughs> and people are not understanding that it's just people in the Middle East cannot take it anymore. They should have understood that long time ago when the Berlin uh, Wall uh, fell. Uh, they should have understood that the so when the Soviet Union collapsed. That's it. You know, uh, the Western world or, or uh, the United States, they do not need those dictators anymore. Because the war between the Soviet Union, actually, and the, the Cold War was about battles of ideas. And one idea has triumphed over the other, and democracy will have sooner or later to, uh, to, take, uh, to take, you know, over uh, this area. And uh, so we are, in other countries, it has succeeded. I mean, not succeeded, but there was kind of not that much bloodshed as we have in Syria today. Uh, but uh, don't, don't, I mean, don't be mistaken, the, the trouble is not over, neither in Egypt or uh, Libya or other places. I think things are going to take a while until things will settle down. But in Syria, the, it's going to be, unfortunately, it's going to be a disaster. The problem with Syria that people are not understanding today, it's not just Syria alone. The problem with Syria is its relationship with Iran. Uh, <coughs> Iran has a nuclear program, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a whole risk, it's a huge risk for actually uh, the whole area. Iran has, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, it's an imperialist country who has dream of taking control over uh, the Middle East and is using the Shia Arabs. Uh, other countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the rest have tried for the past years to get Bashar away from that uh, from that access. They've tried. Uh, Qatar was Bashar's uh, his best friend. The Tur uh, Turkey became Bashar's best friend too. They tried to woo him uh, out of this alliance, but unfortunately, they didn't succeed. And they uh, and they took advantage of what's happening uh, of this Arab Spring to hijack, in a way, the, the uprising in Syria. So you have Turkey, Saudi, uh, and Qatar have decided to uh, start a sectarian war, in a way, in the region, sectarian conflict, uh, to be more precise. And uh, you started having TV channels, for example, coming out of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> one is based in, uh, in Riyadh and the other one in, uh, in Egypt. Calling, uh, you have this religious man who go, uh, one is Safa and the other one is Wissal, calling on uh, uh, inciting violence against Alawites and Shias. Uh, and this is, this is, I mean, this is, uh, it's not helpful at all, you know. And the same thing you start having, uh, you know, the, for example, the Chief Justice of uh, Saudi Arabia's Supreme Council who came out and said, uh, I call on jihad against the Alawites in Syria, even if two thirds of the Syrian population die. This is again uh, horrible, uh, and so today we find ourselves really like between two fires, between the Syrian regime who's killing those people uh, in Syria who, who rose up 
uh, in the beginning who rose up all in one hand, Alawites, Christians, Sunnis, uh, they were all together chanting peaceful, 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 and one, 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 the Syrian people, they are one. Uh, but unfortunately, when it got hijacked, now we have also armed people inside Syria as uh, head of national uh, intelligence in the US, Mr. Clapper said that Al-Qaeda unfortunately has infiltrated this opposition. So we are, you know, uh, we are lost between these two fires. That was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give it a little bit I asked you to describe your, your, your background a little bit. And one of the points you made was you talked about, there are two points that we really must talk about, but one was yeah. that you talked about the legitimacy of Bashar al-Assad being derived from his father, yes. yeah, the previous dictator in Syria, Abbas. And uh, there are a lot of people, and you know this, that will, uh, that will, who will look at you and they will say that your legitimacy as a, a voice for, for freedom of expression and democracy in Syria, your legitimacy is compromised precisely mm -hmm. by your father. Uh, and I've, I've got a quote here. Your father has been described as possibly the most hated of all Syrians, including those in the regime. Mm. You know what I'm talking about, because yeah, you've had yeah. this discussion very often in the of past. Course, yeah? uh, your father is reviled. And for, some, for many in the Syrian opposition, you know that you too are reviled. That makes your mission mm. that you see yourself as being on extremely difficult. It's true, because unfortunately, the, when my father was in Syria, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, my father started the first uh, Arabic newspaper that called on the, uh, you know, for democracy in the Middle East. It was in 1967. It, the name was Al Fursan magazine. Uh, he was uh, he had he was always arguing with his brother about uh, you know. My father did the coup against the ex the former president Amin Al Hafez, and when he brought uh, President Hafez Al Assad to power, they had agreed that to move towards democracy, that they, they did a coup against a dictator who was also a Ba'athist member, you know, but it was to move towards democracy. Uh, President Assad had agreed, he said, he would move towards democracy as soon as they re returned the Golan Heights that's occupied by Israel. Uh, unfortunately, after, you know, that was in 1970. In 1973, uh, the war happened, you know, between the Arabs and Israel. And uh, President Sadat came uh, to, uh, he called my father in Syria and he told him uh, that the Americans are offering to return the Sinai and the Golden Heights in exchange for peace and economic help. So my father told President Sadat, it's a great idea, why don't you come to Syria and we go discuss it with President Assad. Uh, so President Sadat came, they went together to meet uh, President Assad and President Assad replied that what has been taken by force could only be taken by by force. And my father knew really that President Assad did not want, he didn't care really much about returning the Golan Heights. What he cared about, he really wanted, uh, it was an excuse to stay as a dictator, to run the country as a dictator. And this is when they started shifting in, in Syria. What a lot of people, again, don't know that my father was the first man who introduced women into the, uh, the Arab uh, into the uh, Arab armies, into any Arab army. They had, we had thousands of women at that time who came into the, the Syrian army. <coughs> uh, uh, at the time, I think in 1983, the first woman, uh, helicopter pilot woman in the world was, uh, uh, sorry, in the US was in 1983. Uh, while in 84, my father had nearly 50 women who went to, uh, were, uh, you know, training on the Gazelle uh, helicopters with, in Paris. With all due respect, can I just interrupt again? Because yeah. this, it does sound a little bit like the patriarchal old politics that have been such a problem for Syria. Family clans. It's not really family. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to explain. Too much it's, power, it's not really having too much economic influence, and that has very little to do with a modern concept of democracy and freedom of what, expression. What I'm trying to say in the country, he was trying to be. He was very, uh, uh, I mean advanced for his time. He wanted Syria to move forward very quickly. He had created the, the Association for Highly Educated People. It had over 30,000 members. Even inside the Ba'ath Party, my father was uh, winning. I mean, inside the Ba'ath Party, he had more, more support than the president. What a lot of people don't know is that the Ba'ath Party today is illegitimate. A lot of people don't even ask the question why. Because in 19, uh, the Ba'ath Party's last uh, uh, national congress, which is the highest authority in the Ba'ath Party, it happened in 1980. And after that, there was never uh, the National Congress never met again. Why did ha why was it the last time it happened in 1980? Because everybody voted for my father instead of uh, against the president, and he was named president of the higher court of the Ba'ath Party. 
and that was the last time they'd ever met. And in 1985, it was the last time that the regional congress met. Why again? Because again, most people were supporters of my father. And from 1985 until 2000, there was no meeting. So any party that doesn't have meetings every four years, it's considered illegitimate. It is just, uh, they only had to reconvene the meeting in 2000 when President Assad died to, bring Bashar, to name Bashar al-Assad as head of the party because in the constitution you have to be head of the Ba'ath party to be able to become president of Syria. Uh, but again, when my father left, you know, when, when there was a conflict in 1984, when the conflict came down between my father and my uncle, uh, my father finally left Syria, he was exiled, and the regime started right away, uh, uh, you know, to have a dialogue with the Muslim Brotherhood. And, uh, and they decided, both of them, unfortunately, to blame everything that happened in Syria on my father. Corruption, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what happened in Hama in 1982. And my father came out, you know, lately. It's very sad because my father never wanted to speak about it in the, in the past. My father has a different uh, view, you know. As he, he was raised in a completely different environment, as, as you know, I'm sure some of you are from countries who have the same ideas. You don't speak against your brother, you don't speak against your father, you don't speak against your... No, that's just his mentality. He said whatever he used to tell us when we were young. We said, well, why, why do we have to suffer so much? Why do we have all these media writing against us? Even though we won, what a lot of people don't know, that we won over 30 cases against newspapers in France, but he never came out to, <coughs> to, tell, to tell the truth. You know, and I told you, as you know, when you're a young child at school, it's very difficult to, you know, when the other kids call you, oh, you're the son of this, you're the son of that. And it was very important for us to, to for him to come out and speak, but he would always say, um, it's not up to me, Let's, he, he's my older brother, he could do whatever uh, he wants to me, uh, you know, I will, uh, I will never, uh, you know, uh, I will never talk badly about him. He had, unfortunately, he had to come out uh, a, couple, a few months ago at the Paris conference and he said exactly what happened in 1982, that he never took part of the 19... Uh, 82, what happened in the city of Hama, what a lot well, of people blame him to, for. I mean, it is a fact that you can speak to very many people. I mean, I haven't been to Syria myself, but I have spoken to <coughs> lots of people who, mm. who, who have great expertise on this matter. But and they say that practically nobody in Syria these days doesn't believe that your father was involved in the Hama massacre in 1982. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, we I can mean, talk about course, this. No, no, but of course, when you have a regime, mm. a Syrian regime coming, and the, all their effort is to put, uh, you know, the... the uh, to put all their effort into discrediting you and giving you a bad publicity, what could you, you know? But, it's, but you've, you've mentioned the regime and you've mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, but yes. the, pro the problem for you with, yes. your, with your democratic mission, your yeah. mission for freedom of expression, mm -hmm. it goes much further because as far as I can tell, mm. and I've spoken to members of the Syrian National Council, quite yeah. a few, when I say to them I'm going to meet Rabba al-Assad, yes. they say there's a problem there. Of course they doubt problem. your credentials. But I doubt theirs too. I mean, they're Islamic. They're eighty percent Islamists. You know, the, uh, the Syrian National Council is eighty percent. And uh, one of the members came out last week in Reuters, spoke to Reuters, and he said, "Unfortunately, the SNC is overwhelmingly Islamist." Yes, we do have a problem with Islamists. I personally do have a problem with Islamists. As I told you, I had a very bad childhood with with the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood in Syria are not the same as the ones in Egypt. They used violence. They killed people. Uh, in Syria, they put, uh, they killed 400 cadets at the Aleppo school for being Alawites. Uh, they used to hang girls for, uh, you know, under bridges just because they weren't wearing the veil. Uh, they bombed in Azbakiya in Damascus, a school, uh, you know, a school, uh, girls' uh, school, uh, killing 200 people. I mean, they were terrible. Of course, I have a problem with them, and they have a problem with us. They consider us, they consider us infidels because I'm an Alawite. And the result of all this is that you have a hugely divided country. It is a hugely divided. Where's, where's the future in the situation now? It's very difficult. If people, I always say, if people don't put their grudges aside, if they don't, we, I'm not, I always say, we, we cannot forget about our past because the past will always teach us, uh, you know, uh, uh, not to repeat the same mistakes in the future. But we have to put our grudges aside. We have to work together. I mean, to build a country, if we want to build, uh, build a country, the future of Syria, it cannot be built on grudges and hatred. We have to put that on side. We have to work together. We have to be able to uh, stop this uh, hatred, stop this violence, stop inciting on each other, stop having fatwas against minorities. Uh, because as you know, Syria is made up of 45, what people don't know, a lot of people you hear, oh, 80% is the majority of Syria. This is not true. You have 20% uh, Alawite, or people tell you today 10 or 12%. When were this, uh, uh, I don't, you know, this 
uh, polls or whatever sensor. this, uh, this sensor, uh, yeah, uh, survey is done in the 50s, you know, when people didn't, an Alawite didn't even dare to say that I'm an Alawite, or they didn't even go register their people. In the, when pe a lot of people were born, they didn't even have papers, you know. But uh, today, uh, they are uh, nearly 20% Alawite, another ne uh, 15 to 17% Christians, 20% Kurd uh, Kurds. So this is, uh, then you have the Druze, the Shias, the Ismailis, uh, the Turkmen, the Sharkasian, and th that's a lot of people. That's what I say when you have 45% of minorities in Syria who are very worried about having Islamists coming to power. Of course they want to uh, get rid of a dictatorship, but certainly not to have a theocracy. We have seen what happened in Iran 30 years, uh, 30 years ago, and we don't want to see that same scenario repeated in, in Syria, you know, because that would be a disaster for these people. and, that, and uh, already people now started talking in Syria about uh, division, about dividing. <laughs> but we're here today to talk about cultural diplomacy yeah, yeah, and, and building bridges. Exactly. How, if any way, <coughs> is that possible in this very divided country where I mean, we people try have, to have these dialogue. We, we found grudges? You have to have dialogue. And this is why I created my other organization, I Iman, which is uh, for interfaith and intrafaith dialogue. Because you cannot move towards democracy if you don't have interfaith and intrafaith, you know, between Muslims themselves, which is a huge problem today in the Middle East. Do not continue on calling. The problem is that when people call you an infidel, it's very difficult to sit with someone who thinks that you're an infidel. Because in Islam, it's different than Christianity. In Islam, if you're an infidel, they, that means they have to kill you. You know, and, and it's very difficult. They, they, sooner or later, an infidel have to die, and it's, it's something that they believe in. You know, from, it comes from uh, their Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, who is their, their highest, uh, I mean, he, uh, uh, in history, is their highest authority, who says that all minorities, including Christians, Alawites, Jews, that those people are infidel, and that you have to commit jihad against them to fulfill your Islam, so that you'd be able to go to paradise. Unfortunately, that's a reality. So that today, if we want to have dialogue, they have to uh, bring another fatwa saying that, no, Alawites and Shias and Christians and all their old brothers, we're all brothers of the same country, we're all Syrians, and we have to live together. And have you, in, in your efforts to create dialogue, have you had the opportunity to talk to the Muslim Brotherhood? Is that dialogue taking place between groups outside the Muslim yes, Brotherhood? Yes, no, even the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they, yes, and indirectly, yes, I mean, through people, through so my office in Lebanon. The SNC, you know, we, uh, they said, yeah, we don't have problem with rebel, we don't have problem meeting with rebel, but not the father. Uh, but the problem, I said, yes, but before meeting, actually, it's, you know, of course they need me. You know, I mean, they need me as they need an Alawite, they need an Assad to be with them because it's very difficult. The army, the, the, the you know, has a, the officers and a lot of people are from the Alawite the, and Christians and others. So they need to show that we have uh, an Alawite, uh, you know, an Assad who's with us. But at the same time, it's not about using each other. It's either it has to be genuine dialogue. And this could only happen if they come out with a fatwa against their previous fatwas that came out in the 70s, which called on killing of all Alawites and all other minorities, you know, because that would be very difficult. That's a very interesting comment that you've just made, though, because in the past you have said you see no real role in active politics in Syria in the future for yourself, yeah. but you've just admitted that you could be, uh, at least you could have a symbolic leadership role for your community. No, no I just want to be a bridge, not really. I bridge. said this is how they perceive me, it's not how I, what I want. This is what they, they're trying to do, you know, they're trying to get me... To, to sit with them to show, you know, to play that card with the Alawites in, in Syria. But I'm, I'm not here to be used, I'm not interested in that even. You know, I told you I'm interested, yes, to be a bridge. Uh, I'm interested in dialogue, I'm interested to move forward, I'm interested to have my country, uh, you know, become like Germany, like the UK, like all these countries where I've lived. Talking of dialogue, should we open up the discussion and see yeah, what please, anybody please. else has to <coughs> ask or say? Yeah? Anybody got a question, a comment? Sir? Good morning. I'm Joe Matthewson from Northwestern University in Chicago. What's the significance of the uh, weekend referendum, uh, or is it just window dressing? Yes, uh, of course it is window dressing, because in the previous uh, constitution, we had uh, the constitution, it, it said that uh, uh, it forbids uh, torture, it was for freedom of, uh, freedom of the media and freedom of uh, demonstrating peacefully. All of these were in the previous constitution, but they were never respected. So how do we know that in, the, in this new constitution that they're going to respect that? Uh, and also, even in the, that, this new constitution that we have, uh, I mean, one of the crazy things it says is like, 
the president has to be a Muslim. I mean, why does the president have to be a Muslim when you have 15 to 17 percent Christian in the country? How is that democratic? You know, they tell you, ah, oh, because we have a lot of, you know, 80 percent of the country is uh, is Muslims. We don't want to uh, offend them. It doesn't matter if you don't want to offend them. Give the right to Christians even to uh, to uh, to run for the presidency, and people will vote for them or they won't vote for them. But that's you know that's freedom. That's democracy. It's not you just take them out from the beginning and say a Christian cannot become uh, you know president. And other things like the you know uh, for example, it was really tailored to to f to fit. I mean to to fit them perfectly. Uh, one of the things that they came out with again, uh, you know, in one of their the article of the new constitution is that. Uh, uh, the, the uh, you know uh, uh, all people who have dual citizenship did not run for presidency. I mean, it could work maybe for other countries, but you know, in Syria we have nearly uh, nine million uh, uh, people who are who live abroad, and they don't live abroad just because they they uh, you know if Syria was a great country and it had freedom and democracy, people wouldn't be running away to to live abroad. You know, a lot of them run away from the military service, which used to be two years and a half. So uh, a lot of them run, uh, left uh, because they were, you know, uh, for lack of freedom and of expression. A lot of them were uh, followed by the secret services. A lot of them were harassed, tortured. Uh, so th this is just a crazy thing to say, you know. Uh, uh, and again, I don't think that uh, you could have, uh, I mean, a referendum while you're bombing, you know, uh, cities in Syria while people are dying. I mean, who's going to come out, go to, uh, and vote for a referendum when? <laughs> you know, when they're under fire, like in the city of Homs, for example. Um, so this is, I think it was, uh, it was just crazy. It, it, uh, they think it's a good, it's a first step. They think it's something that they could sell to the Russians and, and Chinese, uh, which I don't think that uh, they know much about democracy neither. But, uh, but I think it was a complete farce and uh, and I, I hope that things will, will change. I mean, even that constitution, I hope that it won't, uh, it will be something that will be drafted in the near future by two parties and not just by one party. <coughs> Hello, uh, Vuk Vukutic from Vilnius University. Uh, Chedwan, uh, when you also mentioned uh, how you want Syria to be like more like the Western countries. And one of the concepts mentioned with spread the freedom of expression and democracy is globalization. And I noticed also you see there's another tendency which is in the world generally, religion, which is, well, as we saw from the Arab Spring. So do you think uh, one of the main problems with bringing more freedom of expression in your countries or generally in countries of Middle East, North Africa would be this uh, religious awakening, and do you have any plans to, I don't know, oppose it in any way? Awesome. <coughs> uh, the, the sad thing again today is that, uh, unfortunately, you know, when the uh, when there was a Cold War, I think the Western countries were promoting democratic parties. They put a lot of efforts and money into promoting democratic parties. Today, unfortunately, the West doesn't have money. Uh, is not interested, I think, anymore. I, I mean, they, they give very small things to set up a website or a magazine or something like that. Uh, um, but the problem is that the countries who are today help, giving all the money is Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And those countries, in their interest, of course, they're not going to go and help with the, uh, democratic parties. So who do they go and help? They go and help the Islamists. That's how we see, for example, uh, the, uh, how the, the revolution in Egypt, I mean, how it was hijacked again by the Muslim Brotherhood. Nobody thought why did the Muslim Brotherhood get the first position? Of course, because they were supported by Qatar. And why did the Salafis get the second position? Because they were supported by Saudi Arabia. And other young people, uh, girls, uh, the, the democratic parties who were out there uh, in Tahrir Square in the beginning, all those people got nothing. You know, they got nothing because nobody supports them. Even one of... Uh, one of, I mean, a friend in a way, uh, Najib Suarez, for example, a, uh, who we met uh, at different uh, occasions, uh, and he spoke. He said, "I have." He ha he set up his own party, which, you know, uh, uh, he be, I mean, he came out third as you know after the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis, because of course he's the richest man in Egypt. But he still, he said, "I don't have as much money as Qatar and Saudi." So this is how you see how people today in the Middle East, money is playing a big problem. 
uh, I mean, uh, is playing a big role and making a big problem. <laughs> and we've seen also again what happened in Libya, with the Qataris giving all this uh, uh, money and arms and facilitating even a lot of deals uh, to get gas oil from uh, VTOL and other company. So it, it shows you how the Islamists, with the help of those countries, yes, they're going to get support. Of course, it's not because of the ideas and because people are pro-Islamist. No, not, not at all. It's just today people there's an economic crisis. People in the in the Middle East are starving. And whoever comes with, you know, uh, with a lot of money, helps these people, uh, do a lot of social work, uh, you know, they're the ones who, like we've seen again in, in, uh, in Gaza and Ramallah, you know, Ramallah, the people were taking all the money, they were very extremely corrupt. Hamas came, you know, they, did, they started doing a lot of social work, you know, of course, they, 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 they won the elections there. My question is more to Peter Graven. Uh, Assad said that Tony Blair went and congratulated Assad. So my question is, shouldn't Blair be implicated somehow in all of this? I mean, also, Blair also did lie to his own people about the lead up to the Iraq war. And he was basically a pawn of Bush. So to me, it seems that the West is just using democracy for its own purposes and they're spreading it around like it's confetti and it's going out of style. So what do you have to say about this? I'm not quite sure in what capacity you're asking me this question, either as, a, <laughs> uh, as the moderator of the mm -hmm. event these few days or as a... Or as a I a just think you're British being a little bit too perhaps, hard on Mr. Yeah, Assad. Or basically. as a general observer. I mean, my, my answer to that would be, and I really want to uh, play my cards a little bit close to my chest, is that, is that uh, I do think that one of the issues we're going to be talking about in the next couple of days is interventionism in general and the pitfalls of interventionism. And that's what you're talking about. We're, talking, we're going to be talking about the pitfalls of interventionism, which is, in, in, in journalistic terms, is often called activism. And we're going to be talking about those two areas and about the pitfalls of those, and that's what you're referring to. Yeah? It, I'd like to just pass the question on, though, because I do think it is, a, it, it is an extremely relevant question about the, the whole aspect of realpolitik and how you deal with an ongoing and emerging situation in a country like Syria. Because you suggested that the Syrian National Council is dominated by the Islamists. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting contention given that many... Think that, that's a complete disaster. But I'm sure, you know, the problem behind it is that it was the Saudis and the Qataris who are pushing for them. And as you know, the problem again is because of, you know, when Qatar promises to invest $100 billion in, in, the, in, in, Euro, uh, in Europe this year, of course, I mean, they, they could... Uh, you know, they could call the shots. Unfortunately, if uh, that's what they call real politique, when we have Bahrain, that's uh, you know, when you have the Saudi army and the other uh, you know Gulf uh, armies, GCC armies in Bahrain, uh, uh, crashing the demonstrators and nobody's saying any a word about it. You know, then you understand what's real politique. Unfortunately, why is the people in Bahrain being treated differently than the people in Syria? You know, why is pe why are the people not saying anything about those people in Bahrain? I was personally in Bahrain two weeks ago. I saw the tanks, the, the tanks, the, the armored vehicles everywhere in the streets, machine guns. And the, the, the people in Bahrain, the uprising in Bahrain, they don't even have weapons. You know, they have bottles of alcohol, uh, you know, uh, uh, cocktail molotovs, you know, whatever. But they, they don't have machine guns. They don't have guns. So uh, this is unfortunate, but this is what's happening today. It's very, it's very sad, but this is what's happening. Um, it, it sounds as if you're saying what the West is doing now is what it's traditionally done, and that is try and back what it thinks will be the winner in this conflict. Um, and now, as in at times at the, in, in the past, it's got it wrong. Um, that seems to be what you're saying, but I, and I'm interested in the suggestion that the West completely got it wrong with Bashar al-Assad when he came to power. I mean, I remember reading all those editorials in The Economist in The New York Times. He's a reformer. He's going to try and change the country. Um, and you said that that was all a myth and the West bought that. Um, but at the same time, you said when he did try to reform, he was hampered by the army and the vested interests. Yeah. Um, was he someone who came to power in Syria, genuinely believing that he could change the country? And number one. And number two, when he realized that he couldn't, was he simply falling back on um, what he deeply believed, which was that he wasn't really interested in change anyway, or did he realize that he couldn't beat the generals and he couldn't beat the authorities? I mean, what was his commitment to freedom of expression and freedom and democracy? when he came to power? Well, I, I honestly believe that, <coughs> that he had, he wanted to change. 
you know, he wanted to bring. Yes, but I mean, it's, they got that right in a way, but they, what they didn't get right is that it's Syria. They know very well how Syria is going. I mean, come on, they know very well who are the generals who control Syria. They know very well how the secret services is run in Syria. They know very well how the whole country is run by those corrupt people. So you cannot have someone of 34 years uh, of age coming in and, uh, you know, with very little experience being able to put all those generals aside and to, uh, moving towards reform. This is where they got it wrong. You know, so if Bashar needed, re wanted really to do reforms, he should have tried to uh, call on national dialogue and have a national unity government before he starts that. You know, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, it's not that they, they, they got it wrong. I, I told you, I honestly believe because even his wife, you know, uh, Asma, she, she's a, you know, she's a woman. I mean, uh, she's British. You know, I mean, she's Syrian, but she's also British and. Uh, she's highly educated. She came to Syria and she tried to do a lot of change, even and, you know, for charity. And she wasn't able to do any of her charity works. Why? Because every time that she would try to do something, again, there were reports from the secret services who would say, when well, she tried to do something for uh, children who are, um, you know, have, uh, how to say that, who have uh, problems, who are children who uh, have physical problems. Um, yes, handicapped children. And unfortunately, uh, even, even that, uh, reports came from secret services, oh, people will, will start cutting their legs off, you have uh, children who would start to do this, start to do that, this is uh, crazy, this is, you know, because they knew very well this is another way towards reforms. You know, it's, it's maybe a small way, but it's another way towards reforms. And they, they stopped her. She tried to do many different things and she was stopped. So, uh, I'm still confused as to what your criticism is of the international community at that time. Because surely it made sense to publicly bolster Assad if he was seen as a possible agent of change. So, I don't know, Blair going there and, and Hillary Clinton <coughs> or whatever. That was surely absolutely the right thing to do. Um, now, what you do beyond that to try and influence those entrenched interests, mm -hmm. the army, um, uh, the yellow white minority, whatever, who do have power, that's a separate thing. Yes, but you know when the constitution of a country changes for someone in 45 minutes, that's already, a bit, you know, uh, it's not something right. And second is that they had to, and as I told you before, it's Syria, you know, geopolitically is, is different from other countries. It's very uh, sensitive. You know, the Syrian army was in Lebanon. They had a problem with Iraq. They had a problem with uh, many of its neighbors, uh, with Turkey. And uh, so it was very... You know, it was very naive of them to think that someone like Bashar al-Assad could do something to change that. You know, it was very naive of them to just back him just because he says, I'm a reformer. You know, but at the end of the day, you have to see, is he able to do something or not? You'll back him if you see that he, ha he has ability. That's why a lot of times they came and say, oh, Bashar al-Assad can not keep a word, he's a liar. You know, it's not that he's a liar. He really genuinely, when he talks to them, he promises things, but he can't deliver. Because at the end of the day, if he promises, you know, uh, uh, his father, when he used to promise things, he was able to deliver because he was a strong man. But Bashar cannot deliver uh, anything. But at the same time, he's a president, so he cannot tell them, no, sorry, I cannot do that. So he has to give them a positive answer. But at the end, they would find out right away that he, he's, you know, uh, he wasn't able to accomplish what he, what he promised them. <laughs> yeah, just briefly. Uh, since we're talking about um, the revolution of media uh, as a tool of freedom of expression, what what media, how, what alternative media are you and your people and other opposition members uh, in Syria, in and outside Syria, actually using to, and how is it, how does it work, how is it funded, and is it having any impact at all? I mean, to, to be very honest, other than the satellite uh, news TV channels, you know, that are there today, uh, it's very difficult to, for example, say the internet has played a big role in Syria. And the internet has played a big role into showing to the outside world what's really happening inside Syria. But inside Syria, it has played very little role because what people don't know is that there's, it's one of the smallest penetration in the world. Syria has only 16% penetration rate, you know. Uh, because even if you get internet access in Syria, you cannot get ADSL lines, you know, the landline or the fast line. So you need like an hour to just to, to open a page. Uh, and to get an ADSL line, it's very expensive. People cannot pay for it. Normal people cannot pay for it. And other than that, it's not even available. 
So uh, it's very naive to say, yes, Facebook played a huge role, or Twitter played a huge role, or whatever played a huge role. I, I don't think it played any role, actually, uh, in demonstrations inside Syria. What it played, as I told you, is to bring those videos and, uh, and, put, and uh, posting them on Facebook, on YouTube, and other places, and help the activists like us and other people to show what's really going on in, inside Syria. Um, but um, media-wise, the problem, even with satellite TV channels, is they're not very... Uh, you have to look at the two sides. The regime is, of course, uh, you know, uh, I mean, dictatorship, it's, it's horrible. They use their media just to, to give their side of the story. Uh, they don't allow the foreign media to come in. So, for example, I told them from the beginning, if you're really saying they are Islamists and fighters, why don't you let the foreign media come in, the Western media? I'm sure they, 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 they would report on what's really happening on the ground. You know, because a lot of people in the beginning were not even believing that there were armed people on, on the ground in Syria. But again, it's, it's the, the mentality of a dictatorship. You know, no, we keep everybody abroad, we keep everybody away. Um, but on the other hand, you have a lot of other people who st started taking advantage of the situation, like, for example, Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera, Al, uh, Al Hayat. All the, prob the other problem we have on the other side is most Arab media, 90% of the Arab media, is owned by the Saudis and the Qataris and the Kuwaitis. You know, Al Arabiya is owned by Saudi Arabia. I mean, they, they want democracy in Syria. It's strange, Saudi Arabia is, uh, the, the, I don't think that it's, uh, it has anything to do with democracy. You know, uh, a woman can't drive, a woman doesn't have any rights, she can't, you know, I mean, they have uh, huge problems. Uh, and they talk about uh, corruption. Al Arabiya is owned by uh, King Fahd's brother-in-law, the late king of Saudi Arabia's brother-in-law, Al Ibrahimis, and they were the most corrupt people in Saudi Arabia. They're exactly like the Mahnouf family in Syria. Which, is, uh, which are Bashar's cousins from his mother's side. You know, uh, they own the NBC TV channels, they own all the t television channels. The uh, Al Hayat newspaper is owned by Khalid bin Sultan. Uh, again, Prince Khalid is uh, Saudi Arabia. Al Sharq al Awsad by Al Walid bin Talal. Uh, you know, Al Jazeera by the Qatari government. So you see, so it's all one sided. All the Arab media, again, is one sided. This is why it was very important for the government to allow the Western media to go in. You know, Okay, if you have a problem with Arab media, you have a problem, but you should allow the Western media to, co uh, to go in because Western media will tell, uh, uh, you know, they're very, uh, I mean, they have honesty and they, they will tell what they really see uh, on the ground. And they wouldn't we wouldn't have to have this incident, with this unfortunate incident with uh, what happened, you know, uh, in Homs with, uh, uh, you know, um, Mary Colvin and uh, Mr. Kolchak. And it was very, uh, you know, very upsetting and very sad. That is certainly something we can all agree on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I've been given the signal. We're going to take a, a break now. Yes, Al-Assad, thank you for your thank insights you and your observations. Thank you.